So what I'm going to try to do in this talk is uh, give my perspectives on what it's been like to work as a DOE scientist for a number of years. Uh, this is actually a picture of Lawrence Livermore uh, National Laboratory, which I could try to put the cursor over, over it for the other. And uh, which I'll uh, spend some time talking about DOE in general, but also some specifically about Livermore. This is kind of the uh, high performance computing building, and this is actually the National Ignition Facility, which is the world's largest laser, and I'll come back and, and talk some about that as we go through the talk. So the basic outline is, I'll tell you what the DOE National Lab System is, and I'll assume people don't actually know that much about it. And I'll talk a little bit about academia versus industry versus the DOE National Labs. And then I'll do a little personal storytelling and I'll tell you how I got started working for DOE and uh, what I've been doing for the last 34 years there. And then I'll segue into talking about uh, the mission and science of Lawrence Livermore, which is the lab I actually know the best and have been there a long time. I'll end with some general remarks and then some questions. And by the way, please feel free to ask questions during the talk. In fact, I will be disappointed if nobody asks some questions during the talk. Uh, I don't have all that many slides, and, and, and so there's plenty of time to ask questions during the talk and, and afterwards. So here's a map of the US, and I took this off of the Department of Energy website, and it's a map of where all of the uh, DOE national labs are. And they come in a lot of different flavors. Uh, and they come in, there's kind of two types of breakdowns. One is by color, and the color tells you what office within DOE these labs actually belong to. And for example, you could see there's Office of Science Laboratories in blues, and those are things like Lawrence Berkeley, Pacific Northwest, uh, Argonne, uh, Oak Ridge, and, and so on. And then there's ones in, in the yellow that belong to something called the National Nuclear Security uh, Agent Administration. And actually, uh, that's where Livermore belongs to, and that's why you'll see this in the bottom of every slide, NNSA. Um, and there's actually three national security labs. There's uh, Livermore, there's Los Alamos, and there's Sandia. And Sandia actually exists in two places. Uh, one here in Livermore and one here in Albuquerque, which is the main site. And it's actually not by coincidence uh, that they're sitting right next to Los Alamos and Livermore. The history of Los Alamos and Livermore is they started as nuclear design laboratories in the 40s and the 50s, and uh, Sandia was the engineering laboratory for uh, uh, building nuclear weapons. Since that time, of course, the missions ha have broadened, but their physical locations, of course, are, are still the same. Um, the other type of distinction is between the big multi-program, multidisciplinary laboratories that have somewhere between four and 10,000 people who have budgets of one to two or three billion dollars. And those include things like Livermore, Los Alamos, and Sandia, but also uh, Lawrence Berkeley, Pacific Northwest, uh, Argonne, Oak Ridge, Brookhaven, and then you have a bunch of smaller laboratories. You have, for example, SLAC out here, which is the Stanford Linear Accelerator. So it's very focused. Uh, they do uh, just accelerator physics. There's Fermilab over here, uh, which of course just does high energy uh, physics. There's the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, which is fairly big. I looked it up this morning. It's about 1,600 people. And they only do re renewable energy research. Uh, Ames is a more single program lab and does um, material science primarily. Uh, things like Savannah River. So all of these uh, laboratories make up the DOE national lab system. And it's interesting too that people who work here are not federal employees. So I am not a federal employee. Uh, every one of these laboratories is what we call a GOCO, a government owned contractor operated. So for example, Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory is run by University of California. Argonne is run by the University of Chicago. 
Uh, Livermore and Los Alamos are more complicated now. They're run by a, a private company that's a consortium of University of California, Bechtel, Battelle, and so on, uh, with, with funny names like Linz and Lands for Livermore National Security and Los Alamos National Security. So everybody is actually an employee of those companies, not a federal worker as you would be if you were in the Department of Defense laboratory. Okay. So that's kind of the background of, of, of the things I'm going to say. Yes, please. Can you comment briefly on how, that, do you, how IP works out then? Uh, yes. IP is a very complicated issue. Uh, for example, for the labs that uh, are run by single entities, for example, when we used to be University of California, the IP was shared between the University of California Lawrence Livermore and the inventor. So for example, I have some patents if they actually ever turned some money. I would get a third of that money. Uh, Livermore or Linz would get a third of that money and uh, um, you know, uh, the UC would get, would get a third of that money, so to speak. Um, and in general, when it's even more complicated when you're visiting like I am, there's usually uh, an additional piece of paper that's put in place that primarily says what was mine before is mine, what was yours before is yours, and what we invent together uh, will be joint, and if it ever turns into anything, we'll really talk. <laughs> and so the labs that I have worked at are basically Argonne over here, uh, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab, but primarily I've spent most of my time at, at Lawrence Livermore. Okay. So I thought I would make some comparisons about uh, academia versus national lab versus industry. So, okay, so here's a series of three questions. Here's the easy one. Where's this? For those who can't see, I'm pointing to. Uh, the top picture there. Oh, come on, guys. Where is that? The Granger Library, okay, which I took off the UIUC website. Uh, anybody care to guess which national lab that is? Now, it's actually Argonne, so I've got an Illinois theme going here. And, and here's industry. I took Yahoo. Does anybody know where I got that from? The research park. I took that off of Google Maps. Okay. <laughs> And um, so academia, you all know academia very well. It's primarily, its goal is uh, research, student uh, training and education, uh, service to the community, to the, to the nation, and, and so on. Uh, industry is, is sometimes more complicated. You could say it's all about profit and milestones for profit, but of course it could be much more than that and, and very complex, but generally it's milestone driven, it's not just uh, good research for good research sake. And the national labs are kind of a hybrid between the two. They often have a very campus-like feel to them. Uh, there's a lot of research that is for just good research sake, uh, good research for the nation. Uh, but there's also many things that are very milestone driven. And for example, in the national security labs, the closer you get into the programs uh, of national security, uh, the more things are, program uh, you know, you have milestones and deliverables and it, it feels a little more like industry. And then there's all the supporting research that underlies that and that feels very much like uh, what you do at, at a campus. And I'll say this later on in the talk also, but people move a lot between uh, the national labs and industry and back and forth and uh, the national labs and, and the universities. Uh, I'd say universities have sort of a common culture to them, as does industry, and so do the national labs. I think these cultures are, are somewhat distinct, uh, but between the national labs, things feel uh, fair, fairly uh, uniform. Okay. Okay. So let's go into a little bit of personal sto storytelling. So I started at the DOE National Lab by becoming a student there in 1979. I was going to the University of Illinois, Chicago, and I decided to do a, a summer at 
uh, Argonne National Laboratory. As a result of that, I met some people and I ended up doing my thesis, which was then on what we would call low temperature superconduct superconductivity uh, at Argonne. And so I was an educational fellow there. I spent uh, three years uh, at Argonne, two and a half as a student and a half year as a postdoc when I finished. And it was a great experience. It felt very different than the university to me. So at the university, you know, your professors are usually very nice, but they're, you have a formal relationship uh, with them. At Argonne, it's like you get there in the morning and everybody's having coffee in this little room and you have coffee and you talk about whatever the news of the day is. And then lunchtime comes and you go to lunch with this whole group and you're just treated like one of the research scientists. Obviously, you don't know as much as, as everybody, but you really are treated uh, as one of, one of the group, whether you're a student, a postdoc, or a staff member. And that's been my experience at uh, Lawrence Berkeley and at Livermore as well. And one of the things that I found is when I then went from Argonne to Livermore, it really felt at home. And all of the pieces of advice that my advisor had given me at Argonne worked very well at Livermore. The one I always remember is that everything at a national lab, that you, everything that you want or need is already here somewhere at the national lab. The question is, do you have the wits to find it and the personality to have somebody give it to you? And, uh, and I think that, that that's true at Argonne, at, at uh, the other labs as well. So in 1982, I started at Lawrence Livermore. I switched from low temperature physics to doing high pressure, high temperature physics. So from a few degrees Kelvin up to you know, 20,000 degrees Kelvin. And I put this list here of things that I've done primarily, primarily to illustrate how you can switch around at the national lab, uh, perhaps more than you would in a university uh, or industry setting. And this actually spans my technical career. There's another list I could have put here. I've actually done 14 years of administration at the lab too, uh, but I'm not actually gonna talk about that. So I started out doing uh, high pressure physics. I've done optical materials. Uh, I moved back into high TC superconductivities in the late 80s, early 90s when that was uh, a big deal. At some point, I moved back into magnetism and doing magnetic nanoparticles. Uh, I, I, I'm now doing a lot on energy harvesting, uh, thermoelectrics and solar cells. Uh, and that's actually part of some of the things I'm doing here in MNTL uh, with Logan Liu's group as, uh, on my, on my uh, visiting scientist assignment. And we've also, I've also done things in biological sensing uh, using uh, light to try to look under the skin and uh, using polarization effects to detect cancer. Uh, I ended up having a student that worked on a, a bio accelerator mass spectrometer who just finished recently. Um, and I'll return to this later. I also spent a fair amount of my career uh, building the world's biggest laser, which is the National Ignition Facility. And most recently, I was doing x-ray temperature measurements that were up to 3 million degrees Kelvin. So that's an incredible broad range of things uh, to do. So my experience has been that uh, my career has had a lot of changes, but they've all been under the same umbrella. I've even done uh, partial assignments where I've gone to the UC Office of the President, I've gone to work for technology transfer at Lawrence Berkeley. Uh, I've been editors of scientific journals. You, can't, you can do all these different things, and, but yet it's all under the same, you know, I've had the same employer for you know, 31 years now. Now if you think of DOE, it's really been 34. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch a bit and talk about Livermore in general. So you get, this is the one I know the best, and so give you a sense of what actually goes on at the DOE National Laboratory. So this is an aerial picture uh, of Livermore. Uh, it's about a mile square. Uh, there's actually bicycles all over the place that you can take and ride from one place to the other. Uh, no buses like here in Champaign. Um, 
If you can see over here, uh, see if I could do this with the uh, cursor, that's not working very well, but uh, over here, this is actually the National Ignition Facility, uh, which is the uh, world's largest laser. It's about three football fields uh, wide and three stories tall. Um, and there's also another part of Livermore that's actually about 11 miles away. It's called Site 300, where they do uh, explosive research. Uh, actually, that title comes from an interesting perspective. So when Lawrence Berkeley Lab was founded, they called that Site 100. And when Livermore was founded, they called that Site 200. And when Site 300 was founded, they called that Site 300. All those other names have disappeared into obscurity, uh, but that's actually what this is called. So Livermore was founded in 1952, so we uh, recently just uh, celebrated the 60th anniversary. There's approximately 6,500 employees. Uh, that doesn't count students and uh, temporary employees and so on. This is actually a low figure for Livermore. There have been times when it's been up to almost 10,000 uh, people. 7.1 million gross square feet, 684 facilities, and it's got an annual budget of 1.5 billion. So that is larger than the, uh, what we call the energy labs like Argonne or uh, Lawrence Berkeley. But actually, it's a little bit on the smaller side compared with, say, Los Alamos, which actually is about two and a half a billion. Um, okay, so here, here's a schematic of the budget just to give you an idea. So there's a big chunk over here that's um, uh, what they call weapons activity, but it's actually a whole bunch of national security things. And it comes out, it's money that comes out of DOE, out of the NNSA, okay? And it's to do stockpiled stewardship, it's to do the basic research that supports uh, the national stockpile and so on. Uh, and then there are a bunch of other things, uh, you know, Department of Defense, Homeland Security, uh, DOE science and engineering, uh, nonproliferation. There's a lot of money spent on safeguards and security. There's fences and guards and things like that. Um, so the other thing that isn't indicated on here is what's very important for research. They have a thing called LDRD, Laboratory Directed Research and Development. So there is a tax that we levy on ourselves uh, that is capped by what Congress allows. So in up recently, it's been actually 8%. And you can take up to 8% of uh, the monies here and use it for uh, basic research that supports uh, the missions. And so that kind of research looks a lot like you would see uh, in a university uh, setting. And actually, there's a big fight in Congress though right now. They actually Some people in Congress don't like that program because they didn't say exactly what to do. And so there's a big fight right now over what that cap should be. Should it go down to 4%, for example, which would have a big impact uh, you know, on the research down at the labs. OK. So I'll, I'm counting. So far, I've had one question. So you guys can think about that. Uh, OK, so we try to do things in broad, multidisciplinary teams. I think they've, this must be, looks like summer students all smiling. Uh, in, a, in a photo op. And this is kind of saying what the uh, breakdown of uh, research disciplines are of the people. So engineering makes up 35%. It is actually the largest uh, department at Livermore. Physicists make up 19%. Uh, computer science, 14%. Uh, chem, 7 uh, Math, 6 Bio, 4 and other. And the bio is a little deceiving because there is actually a fair amount of biological research that goes on in the lab. And I'll mention just, just a little bit at the end. Uh, but not all of it is done by biologists. It's often done by engineers and physicists and people working in multidisciplinary teams. So these are counting people who got bio, uh, you know, bio degrees as opposed to people who are actually doing something related to bioscience. So this is a view graph on the National Ignition Facility. 
And I'll spend a little time on this. So NIF, uh, as I said, NIF is the world's largest laser. Uh, it was built over 10 years, about $3 billion. This slide emphasizes, and it's kind of a dual purpose, this slide emphasizes it, its role in doing high pressure, high temperature physics that is relevant to putting in the codes that uh, calculate things for stockpiled stewardship. Uh, the other thing it's there for is actually to do fusion, okay, to actually uh, create uh, enough energy that you get more energy out than you get in. And we, the vision is in 30 years you'd have uh, fusion reactors all over the country. Okay, uh, the way that it's done, this is called a whole ROM. And what it is, it's a little gold capsule and light comes in from both sides, a lot of light, and it creates a lot of x-rays. And what's in the very center of that is a cryogenic little sphere of deuterium and tritium. And this gets to very, very high pressures and millions of degrees of temperatures, and it gets uh, compressed inward by the shock waves. And when it gets, uh, when the deuterium and tritium gets close enough, it, you get fusion and then you get neutrons uh, coming back out. So when I said I was measuring things at 3 million degrees, we were actually measuring the x-rays coming back out of this whole ROM during this, you know, few nanosecond uh, experiment. And uh, the, the data that comes out of here uh, this is, for example, the phase diagram of carbon at very high temperatures and uh, pressures and temperatures. Uh, it's relevant to what goes on at the centers of the large gas giant planets. Um, and in fact, Livermore has uh, achieved a milestone fairly recently, which is everybody wants to get to break even in fusion, right? Where you get more energy out than you put in. The question, what do you use for your, your baseline? Uh, so if you use all the energy that went in from the capacitors, that's not it. If you even use all the laser energy that hit the sample, uh, it's not there either. But if you consider how much energy is actually absorbed by this little uh, whole round capsule and which caused the uh, compression, they, they actually have now gotten more energy out from the neutrons than is actually absorbed by the capsule. And you actually, if you listen to the news over the next few weeks, you may see that start to be promoted. This happened just before the shutdown, which affected Livermore, and so essentially they were in, people were embargoed from you know, making big news story uh, out of that. So I've actually spent a fair amount of my career doing this, and it kind of illustrates the different things that you can do. So in the late 90s, I actually was working on the optics for this. There's a lot of huge optics that go into steering this beam. Uh, and the last optics that convert the light from red to blue uh, is, a, an op is a material called KDP, potassium dihydrogen phosphate. And they have to grow it into very large, uh, you need lenses that are 40 centimeters across. And so they grow these uh, single crystals that are like 700 pounds and then slice them up. And then when you put a lot of laser light through them, they tend to damage. And so there's been a lot of programs over the years to try to, how to tailor these materials so they don't damage when the uh, light goes through. So I had a project that was one of these LDRD projects that was looking at the basic research of this. And actually with my UC Davis adjunct hat on, I actually had two students who got their PhDs uh, uh, doing that kind of research, who in, who in the end stayed at the lab, actually. Um, and then some years later, uh, after I was doing administration, I went back into the NIF front office and was doing communications and working with the senior managers and so on. And then sometime after that, I ended up leaving administration and going back and doing science. And what I ended up doing is actual x-ray measurements uh, at these three million degrees uh, on, on the implosion. So um, it's an illustration of you know, how, how, th how, how your career can shift around uh, at a national lab yet still be with not only the same employer, in this case the same, the same project uh, over uh, many uh, 
many times through the, through the ringer. Uh, let's see, the lab is very proud of its high performance computing. It's got some of the biggest uh, computers in the world and if it doesn't have the compu biggest computer in the world you can be sure that it soon will have the biggest computer and fastest. It does this for a number of reasons. It does this for national security problems, stockpile stewardship, homeland security, uh, but then they use it for a whole bunch of other things. Let's see if that's the next slide, and it is. Uh, for example, they use it for uh, human health. This is a project over here uh, modeling uh, the human heart at the cellular level. Uh, they use it for uh, climate and energy. Uh, a lot of the Livermore scientists actually were part of that huge team of people who shared the Nobel Prize with Al Gore a few years ago for global climate change research. Uh, they use it for simulations of advanced internal combustion engines, uh, you know, all, all sorts of different things uh, that require uh, large computational uh, capabilities. And not only do they have a, a building full of computers, they have a building next to it full of computer scientists that actually do the algorithm development and help people actually make uh, most use of these uh, computational resources. Okay. Uh, this is uh, an example of making contributions to uh, radiation detection. But actually the reason I left this in the packet is uh, because of this person who's sitting here, who's uh, Natalia Zaitseva. And she actually was a Russian scientist who was very good at growing KDP crystals which were needed for the National Edition facility that I was telling about. And she was very instrumental. Uh, so the lab was able to get her to come over and join the lab and leave Russia in the 90s. And she was actually quite instrumental in growing these 700 pound crystals, which by the way, the lab doesn't then grow for production. They then license that to other industries who, who grow, uh, grow those crystals. Uh, but that was a major success, but after success, she wasn't really needed to do that anymore. So she switched and she started growing crystals uh, for these radiation detection uh, designs and was able to do some really neat things uh, there as well. So again, example of switching careers uh, using the same sort of skills you have at switching careers within the, the national lab setting. Um, this is just a list of some of the domestic and international security issues that the lab works on. And again, I left this in partly because of the audience here being BioNano. There's a lot of things on ChemBio counterterrorism. And, but if you look underneath here, there's a lot of things that are computational, but there's also a lot of things that have to do with sensors and sensor development. And a lot of that is BioNano related. So, uh, this would be one area where people sitting here might have, you know, a strong interaction with the lab. Okay. Uh, again, protecting America's infrastructure. This is another way of looking at it. Again, biosecurity uh, is a big deal. Bioinformatics, host pathogen interactions, environmental monitoring, medical countermeasures. So bio is not done at the lab purely for... Uh, uh, medical research and so on, but uh, it, 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 it actually sort of came out of that uh, genre though because it came out of when they used to do above ground nuclear tests and they had to measure the effects that these things had. That actually was the beginnings of the lab's biomedical program. Uh, but it's really morphed now into these biosecurity things again, which really uh, depend a lot on sensor development and uh, uh, nanotechnology and so on. Uh, this is one on energy and environmental security. Um, so again, climate change, uh, energy analysis, carbon management, and this is my favorite, uh, which is low carbon solutions because that's actually something I'm, I'm trying to work on now, again, with uh, solar energy and, and uh, thermoelectrics and so on. Uh, the lab has a huge effort in, in wind energy actually. 
And that comes about because of energy, uh, engineering expertise and uh, computational expertise that can allow them to design very efficient uh, you know, wind systems and so on. Uh, so that, uh, you wouldn't have thought that that's where the lab would have ended up making a huge contribution, but it, it turned out that uh, it was a, uh, a, a very good target of opportunity for us. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah oh, there you are. Uh, how frequently does the budgeting for all these different research areas change? Uh, like in the next five, ten years, would you expect a similar distribution of the budgeting, or does it change? Oh, that, that, that's a great question. I can put down my cursor here for a few minutes. Uh, so the budget at National Labs are very complicated. Some of it comes in from the Department of Energy, and that depends on what budget Congress gives it. Uh, and as we all know, the budgets never come on time. We don't have a budget now. We just barely avoided being shut down. I thought I was going to be giving this talk on vacation, actually. I, I had already filled out my time card for vacation, as we were required to do. Uh, but that didn't happen, so uh, it depends on what Congress does. Then within the, the government, uh, anything that isn't Department of Energy, we call work for others. And work for others would be NSF, NIH, Department of Defense, uh, whatever. But it's still government things, but they're not Department of Energy. And then we also can work with industry through uh, CRADAs and, and other things. And so. If you look at the different national labs, they have a huge difference in the balance between those. If you look at Sandia, they have maybe 50% of their things are work for others. If you look at Livermore, it's probably only 20%, though they would love to, for that to grow. And so the um, budgets from year to year are very unstable. This wasn't true when I first started there. It was like there were stable budgets and you never even worried about where you just had projects and you worked on them. Now, uh, people also can work on these big projects like NIF or stockpiled stewardship, or you can go out and bring your own money in. So if I can bring in money in some area that's synergistic with the lab, uh, I can do that, and I am, I am trying to do that. Uh, and have various levels of success. And if you do that, you can then run your own program, hire students, postdocs, or whatever it is. Uh, the other thing about budgeting at the National Lab that's different than universities is the first thing you have to do is pay for yourself. There's, you don't have, you're not covered nine or 11 months of the year. You have to pay for staff members. And staff members are very expensive. With all the overheads, partly due to security and other thing, you know, uh, a typical staff member at a national lab will cost half a million dollars. Okay, so that's the first thing you have to worry about. So budgets are uh, very hard to predict. The other thing is there's a little bit of this feast and famine thing. So for example, you can be working on a project that's well funded, and whereas somebody sitting in the office next to you who has similar skills may be working on a project that's not so well funded or is being cut. So you may be thinking the world is great and he's thinking the world is terrible. Okay, so um, the good thing is that when you start out your career, when you come there as a student or a postdoc, there is a big effort made that that is sort of happening behind the curtain as far as you're concerned. So if you know, postdocs are hired, they will be funded for the time that's been been promised, even if you know other things are are not so well in that particular program. So, that, that was a great question. Yes. Does the unstable budget uh, affect job security for people working there? Uh, it does. I, I think at the moment everybody at the National Labs is is feeling a little more nervous than they certainly ever have before. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if 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 Congress goes and doesn't make a budget in January, maybe we're back doing the same thing again, leave without pay, and you know, it's, uh, so all these, all these uh, machinations that happen, what they tend to do is 
the people who have the best options tend to leave. The people who have just arrived and are most mobile, uh, you know, think about leaving and going somewhere else. And that's, that's a very bad thing. The National Lab thrives on getting really good people to come and invest uh, in the laboratories uh, because a lot of what they do, it's, it, it's, it's not, uh, you start out with a set of skills and then you grow, people usually grow into the laboratory and it takes a while to, to fully do that. And so all, all of these, these unsettling things are, you know, are, are not going. It's like adding resistance into the system, all the stop and start. Yeah. Well, let's see what the next one is. Oh, okay. So that's the last slide. Of, well, there may be one more coming. Uh, this is a slide about the Livermore Valley Open Campus. So this is looking, if you, oh, I didn't want to do that. Um, this is showing where Livermore is in the Bay Area. This is sort of Berkeley out here, Silicon Valley, you know, Stanford over here. So the lab uh, is in this Tri-Valley region. And what they're making a big effort to do is have a part of the laboratories that are open to everybody, where you don't need to get badged in or uh, worry about anything like that. Uh, at the moment, there's uh, a part of Sandia that's a combustion research facility that's like that. And we have one trailer. It's a very nice trailer, but it's for high performance computing initiatives. But the vision is actually to build something that's two and a half million square feet of laboratory and office space. It's going to look like a campus and accommodate up to 3,000 people. Whether that's a reality or not, we'll see. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, interest in making these types of collaborations and having industry and universities uh, come and sit at Livermore and take advantage of these various opportunities. Uh, the Applied Research Institute, uh, where I'm being hosted here, uh, actually is thinking of having uh, if we get joint funding, having some presence at, these, at this open campus. In fact, and one of the reasons that Livermore was interested in my coming and spending a year here at the university is to try to uh, make some of those connections happen, as well as doing my own, my own research. Um, the lab uh, is actually not as divorced from industry as I was trying to separate it in that first slide. Uh, a lot of people uh, have had inventions, have started companies, and there's a culture within the lab to try and uh, to try and do that. Some of these people have been, you know, pretty successful and uh, sold uh, sold their companies, made some money. But this is something that. Um, it's much more in the culture of some of the national labs, such as Sandia, where they do this all the time. Uh, but Livermore is switching its culture a little to try and make this as easy as possible uh, for people to do that. Um, okay. uh, the national labs in Livermore as well has a large uh, stake in the communities they live in. Uh, both because you want to be good citizens and because you don't want people to be mad at you and, and, and so on. There's both altruistic and you know, uh, real reasons to do a whole bunch of things. We have a, you know, a campaign uh, uh, home is helping others more effectively that rages you know, millions of dollars every year. Uh, we also do this very fun run on Halloween that's about three kilometers. I used to run it faster than I do now. Um, and we have things, for example, in education, science on Saturday. They're actually making a collaboration between a Livermore scientist and a high school teacher. And they will put together a presentation on NIF or on biosecurity or whatever. And they'll fill auditoriums with 600 people on a Saturday who will come and, and, and view these things. And you know. Uh, the other interesting thing is the lab also provides some 24-7 operational capabilities. This thing called NARAC is the National Atmospheric Release Advisory Center. It's been there a long time. It worked on Chernobyl a long time ago. Sometimes it works on things such as tire fires in the area. But a lot of times it gets called in for big things like the nuclear disasters in Japan. And it has a complete set of all the maps of the world. It has the most uh, accurate uh, climate and weather prediction 
uh, codes available, and it tries in real time to try to predict where these plumes of bad stuff are going to go in enough uh, timeliness that you could say to people, well, you want to go east, you don't want to go uh, south or north or so on. They make real time uh, things. And these were involved in deep water horizon spills and the Fukushima Daiichi reactors. Uh, we also have something called the Biodefense Knowledge Center, which is staffed by people and anybody in the DOE complex can call and ask questions related to anything in bio, biodefense, and so on. And they're staffed by people who know a lot and can find out more and, and make sure those questions get answered. Um, so I ask one of the people in bio there, Chris Culp, to give me some slides since I was talking to a bio nano audience on what we're doing in, you know, uh, that area. So she gave me these slides on the neuronal eye chip platform. I don't know that much about it, but it looks really cool. Uh, it's an integrated system, including electrical stimulation, recording, nutrient and oxygen perfusion via fluidic delivery, optical analysis, and quantitative measurements of cell and health viability. Uh, so if people are actually interested in this, I could actually put you in contact with uh, the people who, who know the most about that slide. Uh, and this is just, a, again, a slide about the Bioengineering Systems Initiative, uh, embedded sensors, iChip platform, three-dimensional tissue constructs. Uh, and so there, again, there's a lot that goes on in that area that I think is related to some of the things that people in this room are doing. Okay. And then I kind of, I'm winding down here. There's a lot of uh, scholar employment opportunities. This is actually aimed more at undergraduates, uh, you know, for summer, summer and so on. Uh, but there's certainly a lot of opportunity for uh, postdocs and for people doing graduate research as well. Uh, there's a whole group of people who can help uh, find opportunities. And I'm certainly, while I'm here on campus or afterwards, I'm certainly, people can call me. I'm happy to help do that. I actually used to do that for a living at Livermore. I used to run all these programs for a while. Um, the other thing I would mention in this category uh, is that if you're within a year of your uh, PhD and you're interested in any of these things, you, we have a uh, prestigious postdoc called the Lawrence Postdoctoral Fo uh, Fellowship that pays a lot of money and gives you a lot of freedom to do things when you're at the lab. And that happens once a year, and it's happening right now. It uh, has a closing date, I think, in November 1. And so if you are at all interested, it's not that onerous of a, uh, a process. So if you at all think that you might be interested, it would be good to put your name in that hopper. And even though you know, may, there's maybe 300 applicants and two people are selected, the people who make it into like the top 50 often get postdoc offers at the lab. So I'd recommend that. So I thought I'd sort of end with some general remarks. And I've made some of these before. Uh, the DOE labs have a culture which is different from academia and industry. And again, this is just my perspective on it. Um, it's uh, much more multidisciplinary. It's much more multidisciplinary teams. Uh, the people, there's a much less a dividing line between students and postdocs and, and, and staff members. Uh, there's a culture of uh, borrowing. A lot of things are available uh, and getting, and getting uh, mission accomplished, uh, but also doing great science. Uh, again, I think the culture between the labs is very similar. Uh, again, when I went from Argonne to Livermore, or I spent some time at Lawrence Berkeley, it really felt like home. Once you learn, it's a little strange. Uh, it's a little strange when you show up, but after you know a month, you feel you know right, right into the culture, and then you feel pretty comfortable whenever you go to a different national lab. Uh, I think people often move back and forth from the labs to academia and industry. I think it's a little bit of the grass is always greener wherever you are. It seems like if you've been to the national labs for 15 years, maybe in, you know universities look pretty good. If you've been a professor for 15, 20 years, maybe the national labs look 
pretty good. Um, but it pretty, you know, people publish a lot at the national labs. So it's, it's different from industry. In industry, you might be in a situation where you're never publishing, and so it's hard to change back. At the national labs, we really prize publications in most of the programs, and so it pretty, easy, it pretty uh, easily can make a case to go back into academia. You could also work in academia. I, for example, have an adjunct professorship at UC Davis while I'm at Livermore. I've had that since 1991. I've graduated students. I've had grants that are coming through Davis. And so you can kind of do those things as well. And again, I think there's a lot of opportunities for students and postdocs, uh, both you know, coming in the summer as well as doing uh, your thesis, either partly at Livermore and being funded partly by Livermore and so on. So that's the end of the talk. And uh, there's been a couple of great questions already, but if there's more, we'll stay until we've answered them all. So thank you very much. Yeah, right there. So from time to time, there are a lot of initiatives by the federal government, uh, such as there's this uh, EFRC. Yes. Uh, energy Research. Frontiers, yes, Senator, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are a lot of national labs, a lot of universities. How does how does that play out? Like, how do the national do the national labs collaborate with each other, or are they given separate funding and separate uh, targets to reach? No, that, that's a wonderful question, and that's happening, of course, right now in in real time. Uh, in, in fact, the, the labs had a sense that this was actually coming down, and so they've actually been working on the EFRC proposals for several months, already putting teams together. Um, the, the ones that were from the previous call get to recompete. Uh, there's one here, at, there's one at Brookhaven, for example, that has uh, the material science department here at UIUC has a, has a piece of that. Um, and so, you can put in three proposals from one site into the EFRC. And so, for example, from UIUC, there's actually an internal, actually today is the day if you want to do it, to get your internal five-page white paper in and so they can decide on which three, assuming they have more than three. You can, however, participate in however many you want to. So, you know, I may be participating in one from Texas A&M, uh, and um, there's many people from Livermore who will be participating, and I'm sure there will be uh, three that are coming out of Livermore that where Livermore is, is the lead. Um, and so these national DOE centers, uh, uh, Critical Materials Hub, all these kinds of uh, centers are a big deal. Uh, there actually aren't all that much money. Usually if we're working with somebody else, if you get one person covered under that, that would be a, a, a pretty big deal. Uh, but still, it, it's, it's a nice way to expand what you're doing and, and to work in these, in, in, these, in these areas. So people are very uh, interested and working very hard to you know, respond to these EFRC calls and others like them. Yeah. And over there? Sure. Um, you know, it, 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 it's a variety of things. So when I first came to Livermore, I was doing high pressure physics, shock physics, on actually this huge two-stage light gas gun facility that could uh, accelerate projectiles up to eight kilometer per second, which is like orbital velocity, and then smash them into these finely made cryogenic targets and uh, measure things at 20,000 degrees Kelvin and a few million degrees, few million uh, atmospheres of pressure. And then in 1987, high temperature superconductivity uh, was discovered. And since low TC was my background, uh, and Livermore had started a program in that, I kind of switched over into that. And then 
later on, I became very interested in optics and you know fast lasers and so on, femtosecond lasers, and so I was able to get some funding to do that. Uh, and then, like in '96, I went into administration. So they were paying me full time as an administrator, but I still wanted to do research. So I, I was kind of looking around for what I wanted to do, and I sort of latched on to this uh, optical materials for, for NIF and optical laser damage. And so I went out and I applied for and got funding to pay for students and postdocs uh, to do those things. Uh, the same thing in the early 2000s, I suddenly got very interested in, you know, magnetic nanoparticles and energy harvesting and all these things. So I went out and I got funding uh, to, to do those things. Um, on the other hand, when I uh, left administration most recently, they actually had a need for somebody to do these x-ray measurements. And so I got recruited to, uh, to do those kind of things. So, uh, so I didn't control that funding at all. I went and worked for a, a big program, okay? And so there's a whole bunch of ways that this happened, but it almost always does happen. People switch around and uh, don't end up doing uh, exactly the same thing. Yeah. All right. Um, so if you haven't signed in on the sign sheet, please do so, and let's thank Dr. Ludeski again. Okay.